Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Brave Bison Group PLC Full Year Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it received during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and we will notify you by email when these are ready for your review. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll, and if you could give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to Executive Chairman Oliver Green. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our Investor Meet presentation. I'm Ollie Green, Executive, Executive Chairman of Brave Bison. I've now been in my role for just over two years, but I've actually been working in digital marketing and media my entire career. Prior to joining Brave Bison, I was the managing director of Top 100 Digital Media and Technology Agency Tangent. I'm now going to hand over to Theo, my brother. Good morning, everyone. My name is Theo Green. Um, Oli and I are brothers, um, and I'm the chief growth officer of Brave Bison. Um, prior to Brave Bison, Oli and I worked together with, with Philippa as well at Tangent. And before that, I worked in private equity at a firm called Brockton Capital at around a billion and a half pounds of assets under management. Hi, I'm Philippa and I'm the CFO of Brave Bison. I've worked in marketing and advertising sector for around 20 years, qualifying as a chartered accountant at Kingston Smith, and then moving on to work at a variety of agencies, ranging from successful independents to big networks. I started working with Ollie and Theo originally at Tangent just over three years ago, and then transferred to Brave Bison from February 2020. Also on our board is a man named Matt Law. Matt was the global chief operating officer at an independent agency network called Analog Folk, and he's now a partner at a uh, Web3 uh, uh, focused uh, venture capital firm called Outlier Ventures. So before we kick off in some detail around Brave Bison, the annual results, and the acquisition of Best Response Media that we reported this morning, we thought it just might be worth touching on, on, on a few of the headlines. Um, some of you will know Brave Bison, some of you won't know Brave Bison as well, um, but the key takeaway for, for 2021, as far as we're concerned, is that it's been a really transformational year. Um, revenue growth on a pro forma level, we've now hit almost 30 million pounds. We recorded our first ever profit before tax, first ever in the company's history. We generated a significant amount of cash. We ended the year with 5.9 million pounds of cash on the balance sheet, and we recorded an adjusted EBITDA of 1.8 million pounds. Um, so a significant year in terms of moving the business forward, in terms of profitability, uh, and in terms of potential for the future. So this morning, we were extremely excited to announce the acquisition of Best Response Media. Um, BRM, as we like to call it, is a leading commerce and mobile development company. Um, it has some really fantastic clients. It currently works with the likes of NatWest and Paul. And one of the most interesting things about the business is that it employs what we call a distributed operating model. And what this basically means is that it, it employs both in a, in a remote circumstance and a hybrid circumstance, uh, teams of people across Europe and North Africa. Um, and so whilst it does have a, a London HQ, it's, all, it's, it's able to access a much broader and diverse pool of talent. And that means that we can hire quicker. It, can mean we, it, it means we can hire better. And in some cases, it means we can hire cheaper. Um, Moving forward, we're really keen to champion this way of working. We feel as though it allow it will give us access to a much broader pool of talent, but also in the medium term, it will allow us to reduce our, our property costs. In terms of what this means for Brave Bison, this acquisition really supercharges what we're beginning to call Brave Bison Commerce. We can now offer client solutions across all of the major technology platforms, and that includes the likes of SAP, the likes of Salesforce, the likes of Big Commerce, and as a result of the acquisition, now Adobe and Magento Technologies. And just one quick thing to, to add there to um, best response: this this acquisition was funded using our, our balance sheet cash. 
and we acquired the business for an enterprise value of £350,000. And we also expect it to be earnings accretive in the first year that we are acquiring it. This slide details some of the key financial highlights for the year. Our top line revenue growth was 50%, taking our revenue to 21.7 million. Part of this was driven by organic growth, in particular from our media network, where we both added new channels and shows and grew our existing channels. Part of it was due to the acquisition of Greenlight, which completed on the 1st of September and so contributes four months worth of revenue to the 2021 numbers. Our gross profit was even more significantly up with an increase of 95% to 7.8 million. The increase in the gross profit margin is due to the fact that following the acquisition of Greenlight, a higher proportion of the revenue is fee-based, which is higher gross profit margins than the advertising revenue from platforms, which is often shared with our channel partners. Our adjusted EBITDA for the year was 1.8 million, which is an increase of well over 1,000%, and we are pleased to report that that then feeds through to deliver Brave Bison's first statutory profit of 0.5 million, and that's after acquisition costs of 0.7 million during the year. This was achieved by both building on the restructuring which we carried out in 2020 and managing to realise the synergies that we identified as part of the Greenlight acquisition. The most significant of these was in property costs, as we gave up the office lease in Borough and moved the whole London team to the Greenlight offices in King's Cross. Brave Bison has also been highly cash generative during the year, with positive cash flow of 3.2 million to, to deliver a final cash balance of 5.9 million and net cash of 4.7 million after deducting just over 400k of government backed loans and 750k of deferred consideration. In the next slide, we've broken out the key elements of this cash flow. You can see that all of the proceeds from the fundraising during 2021 were utilised in connection with the Greenlight acquisition, but we were still able to generate significant cash, both from our profits and from an improved working capital position at the year end. It's also worth highlighting that Brave Bison does have significant tax losses that can be set off against future profits. So there is no significant cash outlay for corporation tax, either in 2021 or expected in the next few years, apart from the payment of pre-acquisition tax liability relating to Greenlight. Um, on the next slide, um, looking forward to 2022, these charts clearly show our trajectory from the start of 2020. These 2022 numbers are from the Sencross Research Note published in January of this year, where we are pleased to report that our progress in Q1 shows that we are on track to meet these adjusted EBITDA market expectations of 2.7 million, another significant increase on 2021. We expect our revenues in 2022 to be reaching double what they were in 2020. We will also continue to be cash generative in 2022, although this will be impacted by payments of the deferred consideration, which was settled in February, and the payment of the legacy tax liability. So Theo's going to go into a little, a little bit more detail in a minute, but we really were pleased with our, our operational performance um, in 2021, and we look forward to, to more su success um, this year. I think a few things that I just wanted to highlight is that our number of Snap shows, our number of shows on the Snap Discover platform has increased. Uh, we're now at just over 10 shows, which is fantastic. And you can see that our, our media network is really going from strength to strength. From an agency perspective, we now have even more large enterprise clients. And, 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 and within those clients, we now have 75% of those uh, are contracted with, with, re with recurring revenue, which is fantastic and allows us to build uh, a, a very stable base of both cash, profit and revenue. Just, just having a little look back at the the timeline for 2021, um, obviously the, the, the management team here today originally invested in 2009, um, took executive positions at the beginning of 2019. 2019, 2019 took to, to executive positions in the beginning of 2020, um, and 2021 was the first full year of of, of trading under the current under the current board. Um, we we announced we had completed the turnaround of the business. From a, from, a, from a sort of monthly profits perspective in January. Um, we launched a new agency proposition in Q1 around managing social media channels on behalf of brands. Obviously, we, we, we already had a very strong presence running social media channels for ourselves. We run some of the, the biggest Facebook pages, the biggest Instagram pages for ourselves, for our own brands. And we then expanded that to include brands for, 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 
for third parties that pay us a fee. Um, we announced a number of new client wins and a positive trading update in July. Um, we then announced a half year report that showed profitable cash generation um, and, and, a, and a positive H1 period, um, the, the, the first of its kind. Um, we then announced in September a 6.2 million pound fundraising and the acquisition of a digital advertising and technology business called Greenlight. Um, we then announced in Q3 and Q4 that the integration was, was going well, was going ahead of schedule. Um, we managed to win a number of new clients in that period as well. Um, we also had a very strong end to the year um, with, our, with our YouTube and Snap channels. As Oli talked about previously, that platform has really been going strength to strength. Um, we've also been performing very well on that platform. So we've been generating much, much higher advertising rates and, 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 and generating more views. Um, and then in January 2022, we announced our, our third positive trading update in 13 months. Um, and we upgraded our forecast for the for the year ahead. So we, we, we've started the year in a really good position. Obviously, it's early days. Our financial year runs to the calendar year. And so we're, we're now into Q2. But we are at this stage very confident of meeting the expectations that, that, that are currently in the market. I think this is a result of already some quite significant customer wins. Um, we announced our RNS reach a few weeks ago um, that, that Le Mans would be joining our, our media network, which is a fantastic uh, client and partner to, to have brought in. Um, at the same time, we've also launched a number of new shows on Snapchat. Uh, we launched a, a show called Sleek, which is centered around female beauty and female grooming. We, we launched a show called Sweet Tooth, which is all around candy and sort of more, more satisfying ASMR content, which has already been a, extremely successful. And, and so it, it's also important to remember that, remember that Q1 is typically actually our most challenging period of the year. Um, what, what, what tends to happen is that Q1 is where advertising spends across the broader market drop having been very high in Q4. And so we still have Q4 to look forward to. Um, but at this stage, we're, we're, we're very happy with, with how trading has been in the first four months of, 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 the, of the financial and calendar year. So what to expect for the, for the next 12 months up until December? Um, one of the biggest focuses inside the business at the moment is, is relaunching the Brave Bison trade brand. Obviously, we've, we've made a couple of acquisitions um, our capabilities as as a as a as an agency services group, as an advertising services group, has now grown. We're now very strong in performance media. We're very strong in SEO. We're very strong in commerce, and we have the existing social expertise of 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 Brave Bison. Um, so we're keen to launch a, a new trade brand that will be happening before we we. we we hope the end of June this year. And the rationale behind that is all about growing client budgets. It's all about moving clients up, up the ladder so that they're buying more than one service from us. Um, we're also very keen to focus on our digital media network. We see this as being the, the, the secret source to the, to the, to the business. Um, it's, it's been growing very well in the last couple of years, and we're keen to keep, keep winning new YouTube channels, keep winning new Snapchat shows, and keep growing that part of our business. Um, we definitely believe we can we can be tightening up operations. Um, as Oli talked about before, our, our, our operating model is changing and will continue to change. Um, we don't we don't think the long term future of the business will involve being locked into a a, a large lease in central London. Um, and then just moving on to that distributed operating model, we think that you know from 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 the business's perspective, we are hiring from pools of talent that don't just exist in London. We're hiring people based outside of the UK. We're hiring people based outside of London. From the business and the client's perspective, it doesn't make a huge difference whether you're located in Southampton or South Africa. Um, and that's one of the trends that, that, that we see growing as, as, as the business moves forward. This isn't a cost-driven exercise. This is more about getting access to, to, to more and more talent and getting access to that talent at a, at a at a better time, time to market. Um, we do think tactical bolt-on acquisitions are, are, are always going to be part of the, of the business plan. We announced one this morning, the acquisition of, of Best Response Media. That brings in Adobe Commerce to our capabilities. Um, we previously were only operating on really sort of top-level enterprise platforms, SAP, Salesforce, and Big Commerce. Now we've added Adobe Commerce as well, which gives us a very broad offering. Um, and we'll continue to look for tactical opportunities like that. 
And then finally, developing the, 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 the board and the longer term IR strategy. And that's definitely something that we that we focus on. Um, we, we are looking for an, for an additional uh, uh, independent non-executive director. And um, that's hopefully something that we can we can do this year. So just just moving forward to Brave Bison um, and, and perhaps for some of the shareholders or the prospective shareholders um, that are still that are still understanding the business. Our, our business has two distinct halves. We have an advertising services business that's about half of our revenue, around 50 million pounds. And we have a digital media network, which, which also generates around 15 million pounds on a, on, a, on a pro forma basis. Um, so focusing on the digital media network, how does this business unit work? How do we generate revenue? So it's very simple. The best way of thinking about us is a broadcaster for the digital age. We have around 650 different channels. And instead of existing on the radio, instead of existing on, on, on TV, our channels exist on various different social media platforms. You will watch our channels, perhaps the PGA, perhaps Comic Relief, perhaps Slick on Snapchat. And when you watch our content, you will see an advertisement. That advertisement generates revenue. And we share that revenue with our channel partners if we have a partner like the PGA Tour or we keep 100% of it in the case of channels that we own, like Slick and the rest of our Snapchat properties. YouTube is, is the biggest platform for us. Um, this is where we have the, the greatest number of channels and where we generate the majority of our revenue. We have some very strong niches in areas like tennis. We run the channels for the US Open and for the Australian Open. We had a record performance at the Australian Open, which, which happened in January this year. We're also very strong in areas like music, we have entertainment channels and we have channels about politics in various different countries. The majority of our audience is English speaking, but we do have a strong Spanish speaking contingent, um, both in, in, in America and parts of the Caribbean. Snapchat is one of the newer platforms. We've been operating here for a couple of years. This has grown rapidly and is a, is a, is a, is a space of much focus for us. Here we own the channels ourselves. So these are our brands that we take to Snapchat and we develop. The majority of the content that we use here is licensed and editorialized by ourselves. So the margins on this are very high. From time to time, we produce content ourselves, but principally we find this content and license it. We build shows around specific, specific themes um, because we have such a close relationship with Snapchat. They tell us the kind of content that they want to see. On TikTok, we have a, a property called The Wave House. This is something that we share with us with a specialist influencer marketing agency. And this is an example of where we do create our own content. And we don't create our own content to, to deliver the same kind of margins that we get from working on YouTube or working on Snapchat with licensed content. We do it because it's very good for both sides of our business. So the, the, the Wave House was something that we launched in, in Q1, Q2 last year. Um, it was essentially an influencer marketing TV show where we rented a giant house down in Surrey and we flew in a bunch of influencers from the US and the UK, recorded them for six weeks and published the content simultaneously on YouTube, Snapchat and Instagram. Um, it received a, 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 a number of awards. We, we managed to get some of the content sponsored by a record label um, and it was extremely productive for the services side of our business. Um, who, who found the fact that we did this really compelling. So Theo's talked a little bit about our digital media network, which is where we generate 50% or around 50 million pounds of our revenue. I'm now going to talk a little bit about our digital advertising services, which also generates 50% or about 15 million pounds of, of revenue. So we like to break our digital advertising services into three distinct pillars, Brave Bison Social and Influencer, Brave Bison Performance, and Brave Bison Commerce. Brave Bison Social and Influencer is probably our most creatively led part of our business. Brave Bison Social and Influencer works with large enterprise global clients like Panasonic and Uniglo to really help them navigate the likes of Facebook, TikTok, um, even Twitter, LinkedIn. We, we, we help clients with their social media strategy. We help them create content for social media platforms. And more and more so, we run influencer marketing campaigns, which is where we go out into the market, we find creators that have big followings on different platforms, and we use those creators to promote the client's product or, or, or message. Brave Bison performance is slightly more different. If I think about social influencer being perhaps more creatively led, Brave Bison performance is very much more data led. 
Brave Bison Performance is where we manage paid media campaigns on behalf of our clients. So a client will come to us and they'll say, okay, I've got maybe half a million or a million pounds to spend and I need to see this return on investment. I need to, I need to generate this amount of, of sales. And we will manage that media budget across the likes of Google, Facebook, Instagram, and other digital media platforms. We are essentially helping our clients to drive sales and acquire customers online. Brave Bison Commerce is probably the most technology focused part of our digital advertising services. This is all about designing and building transactional websites and digital applications that allow our clients to ultimately transact online. If, if, if Brave Bison Social and Influencer is about creating content that, that drives awareness and Brave Bison Performance is about driving customers to an actual uh, a website or an app, then Brave by some Commerce is allowing that customer to actually transact online. So we employ teams of designers and product managers and project managers and engineers, so, so developers, and they actually um, consult, design, build, and maintain digital applications. As you can see here, we work with a, a really broad range of global clients. We, we like to work with large enterprises, clients that are, that are, that are working in multiple mar markets and have multiple different parts of their business. As you can see here, we work with a, a range of both B2B and B2C clients. But I, I think there's probably three areas that we're beginning to focus on more and more. The first is fintech, which is an extremely exciting part of the market. The second is, is, is commerce. And the third is gaming. And, and, and all three of those sectors have really benefited from the sort of acceleration into digital transformation that we've seen since the start of the pandemic. So one of the things that's important to us on both sides of our business is how we use technology across across both sides of the aisle. And I think what we're keen to, 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 to do is ensure that our business is, is, is running as effectively and as profitably as possible. And we believe, and, and this is something that absolutely we, we advise our clients on as well, um, is that running a, a combination of man and machine um, is, is definitely the way forward, the, the, the cyborg approach. Um, and I think the, the focus for us is how can we make our services faster? How can we make our services better? How can we make our services cheaper? And we do find that occasionally we come up against competitors who haven't employed the same tactics, who don't understand the way that some of the, 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 the technology available can change the way in which we, we, we market. Um, and that makes us far better when it comes to, to winning work. Um, there's there's two there's two ways of working. One is by using the plethora of tools available um, to 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 the advertising services business, um, which we absolutely do. There are so many different software applications that allow us to 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 work harder and to do to to deliver better for our clients. But occasionally we build tools ourselves, and we build these tools not necessarily to sell to our clients under a license fee. We're not a we're not a software as a service business, but we are a business that, that that wants to be able to deliver in excess of our competitors. So, a very good example of that is how we work with artificial intelligence. So, artificial intelligence is really just uh, 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 it's really just becoming um, something that people are, are thinking about at the moment, and it's dominated not actually by businesses but by research organisations. Um, one of them at the moment is called OpenAI. Um, it's a it's a it's a totally open source, non-proprietary uh, research organization where all of the algorithms can be used by anybody. Um, a lot of people have taken these algorithms and, and built on top of them to build products. We've done the same thing, but in the context of, of search engine optimization. So, for example, some of our clients are omnichannel retailers that have tens of thousands, if not sometimes hundreds of thousands of different products available on their website. So when it comes to optimizing keywords and optimizing the written content on those web pages, manually making changes to all of those different pages becomes something that can't, can't really be done at scale. So we went to the, 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 the OpenAI 
AI research tool. Um, it's called GPT-3. It's called GPT-3. Um, we built some software on top of that um, that allows the, the, the tool to ingest the kind of clever SEO content that we write for our customers. So we take a selection of those 10,000 pages. We teach the AI how to write effective copy for search engine optimization. And then we run it across the remaining seven, eight or 9,000 pages. So this is an example of something we ran for an electronics retailer in the UK. Um, this sentence, if you're looking for a mobile phone without a contract, was totally written by a piece of software. Um, obviously, that piece of software was trained in search engine optimization and advertising copy, but it was totally written by a machine. Um, and this, this obviously gets done in a, in a fraction of the time. So people are a, a huge part of our business. The, the market for, for talent is, is, is hot. Um, and, and, and we've touched upon how we're sort of uh, uh, navigating that. And one of the things that we're, we're doing is, is, is opening up these hubs across Europe and across North Africa now after the acquisition of, of Best Response Media. Th this slide really details the extent to which we listen to our, our staff. We do a quarterly engagement survey where we ask questions about how engaged and how happy they are at work, any suggestions that we can make. And this is all about creating a fantastic employee experience so that we can attract and retain the best talent in the market. Um, and, and that's not just in London, not, not just in the UK, but across uh, Europe and now North, North Africa. So our vision for, for Brave Bison, this diagram depicts our current business as well as an, an expanded model. On the left-hand side, you have our current digital and social capabilities that exist within Brave Bison Performance, Brave Bison Social and Influencer, and Brave Bison Commerce. But you also have new capabilities that we're really keen to develop. These include app economy marketing, conversion rate optimization, and Amazon market, marketing. On the right-hand side of the di diagram, you have our existing media network that includes our YouTube channels and our Snap shows, but you also have things like podcasts and gaming teams and even more Instagram communities. And we're really keen to expand into new content verticals and new content niches. The business model for the left-hand side will always be fee-based income. So that's usually large enterprise clients paying us, paying us for a service. On the right-hand side, you have a combination of advertising and branded content, but then we're also keen to develop over time much more of a direct-to-consumer revenue line, and that will include things like subscription and even commerce. And what we're creating here is really a flywheel for growth because one side feeds the other. The bigger and more engaged our audiences are on our media network, the more relevant they become to, to large enterprises or clients and partners buying our digital capabilities on the left-hand side. At the same time, the teams, the talent that we employ to service our clients on the left-hand side loves to work on building out the network on the right-hand side. Finally, we thought it might be helpful just to give a brief overview of the current shareholder register of Brave Bison. Ollie and I are the largest shareholders in the business, um, having acquired a, a, a significant stake back in 2019, um, made subsequent investments and then committed um, a further million pounds in the fundraising that took place in September. Followed by us um, are two institutions, CIP Merchant Capital and Lombard ODA, um, both of which took place in the, in the fundraising that happened in September. We also have two very, very supportive private family offices um, and, and further institutions on the red re register in the form of Trium Capital, Premier Mighton, Risk Capital Partners. Um, on top of that, Philippa Norwich is also invested into the business, um, both in, in capital she's committed and through share options. We thought it might be helpful for prospective investors on the call to outline what we think are the top five reasons to invest in Brave Bison R. Number one, our committed and experienced management team with skin in the game. Number two, the digital advertising market is growing quickly and we're perfectly positioned to benefit from this as brands move their spend away from traditional channels like TV and radio and towards social and digital platforms. Number three, 
our commercials, including our balance sheet with net cash and the fact that we're now trading profitably on a month to month basis and that we generate cash. Number four, we're already global with a with a footprint in the UK, now in North, in, in North Africa and across the Asia Pacific region. Number five, we have a clear plan to build a much bigger business by growing our existing business organically and making targeted strategic acquisitions through our strong balance sheet. Thank you very much. Let's we'll now open up for Q&A. Ollie, Theo, Philippa, that's great. And thank you very much indeed for your presentation this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab that's situated on the top right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while Ollie, Theo and Philippa take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Uh, Theo, Philippa, Ollie, as you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation, and thank you to all investors for submitting their questions. If I could please just hand back to you just to run through that Q&A tab uh, and where it's appropriate to do so, if you could just read out the questions and give your response, and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Thank you. So one of the questions that's that's come up um, is sort of why why are you different? Um, what 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 makes you different? What's your USP, and and how are you going to win business over your competitors? I think the, the the first thing to note is that we have a slightly different approach to how we work and who we work with. Um, there are a lot of digital advertising agencies and there are a lot of digital media publishers. There are very few that combine those two service offerings. And that's been a function of how the world worked previously and how digital advertising worked previously. But more and more, these two business models are coming closer together because ultimately, the majority of digital advertising services involve some form of buying digital media. Digital media is the same inventory that you're selling as, as, a, as a digital publisher. Um, so we feel that by having these two business models together um, works really, really well in the face of, of new customers. We, we, we have Instagram accounts that we own and that we manage and that we run that have millions of followers, and we do that for ourselves. So the fact that we eat our own dog food makes us quite a compelling partner for a brand that wants a presence on Instagram, given that we do it for ourselves. Um, there was a question around target revenue per employee, which I can probably speak to. Um, so we tend to look more at um, a sort of gross profit per employee rather than top line revenue because of the different business models within within our business. Um, so as a, as a rough rule of thumb, I would say benchmark um, would be around 100,000 per employee um, plus. Um, so we're looking for something definitely upwards of that. Um, in terms of what we would do to improve that ratio, I think Theo spoke quite a lot earlier about the technology stack and the various ways in which we can use technology to be more efficient and to deliver things cheaply for our clients, but still uh, maintaining good margins for ourselves. Um, so that's obviously key. Um, and then we also look at rolling out tools for things like resourcing tools and also making sure that we get the pricing right in terms of setting the right rate cards. There's a question around margin expansion opportunities as well as well as wage or potential wage inflation pressure. I think from a margin expansion perspective, one of the things that we did touch upon uh, this morning is this idea of a, a, a new look and feel for Brave Bison, a new, a new brand for Brave Bison, and that being able to pitch for bigger uh, uh, briefs from customers. I think what, what, what we're beginning to see is once we sell in one service, so for example, it might be Brave Bison Social and Influencer, we actually have more and more of an opportunity to sell in a second service. Um, typically, Brave Bison Performance can often uh, come in after Social and Influencer. And what this sort of cross-sell does is it actually does improve the margin because the cost of sale is, is reduced. Another thing that I think that um, does have an impact on, on margin and it sort of addresses the wage inflation point, I think this, this distributed oper operating model is really, really important. Um, we are finding that there are hubs of talent in, in really quite unusual, unusual places. 
We've talked about setting up an office in Bulgaria. Um, that would be a, a small physical office, but it has the potential to be a, a big office in terms of number of people attached to it. Um, and so th th this, this new way of working that, that really leans into hybrid and remote working um, really does allow us to increase margin, but also head off uh, wage inflation that you're currently reading about uh, in the UK and London, especially within the sort of context of, of digital talent, which is obviously very much high in demand right now. We're also having conversations with clients about putting up prices. I think that, that I think that's becoming more and more anticipated from some of our partners. Um, I think you, the, the, everyone reads about it in the media, your Netflix, your Spotify, they're all going up. And so, you know, some of that cost can, can be passed on to, to some of our partners. There's a there's a question about um, ad spend and sort of global global ad spend on Facebook and YouTube and the various different platforms. I think you know tracking tracking the sort of the two giants is 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 certainly helpful. Um, but there are other platforms out there. Pinterest has has, has been doing very well recently, um, and other platforms have have been doing well. I think we we feel that the the overall spend moving from analog into digital um, that has been irreversibly changed as a result of the pandemic um, is, 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 is what pushes the business forward on a, on a macro level. Um, I think the attribution offered by digital advertising and the fact that so much non-digital advertising was turned off during the pandemic has allowed brands to see just what a fantastic impact it has on their business. And we don't think that the overall the overall rotation from non-digital into digital will be changing anytime soon. Um, and given that that's, that's what we do, um, we feel there's enough growth there to, to push the business forward. There's a question about, uh, are we planning any capital raises in the next 12 to 24 months? Um, and, and so what I say to that is, is, first of all, our business does not require outside capital, capital to run. We are profitable and cash generative on a monthly basis. Um, as you can see, our business does grow organically, which is fantastic, and we're very keen uh, for that to continue and actually for that to increase. Um, with the cash that we generate, we do look to uh, acquire other businesses. A, a perfect example of that is, 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 is Best Response Media, right? We, we acquired that with existing cash on the balance sheet. In terms of bigger deals, we are looking to scale our business, and so... It, it is possible that, that, that we look to, to raise funding, but that would only be for a, a creative transformational deal that, that increases earnings per share. I think that, you know, Theo and I are the largest shareholders in Brave Bison currently, and we, we are absolutely aligned with shareholders in terms of creating value. In the event that we do uh, 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 raise raise funding. It's because there is a deal that makes incredible strategic sense that is accretive and that will drive the business forward faster than it's currently going. Um, our, our ambition is not to remain a, 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 a very small business. We're, we're not in a rush, but we are seeing lots of opportunities in the market. And so it is possible that over the next 12, 24 months, there will be a, a, a fundraising, but only for a deal that makes sense, that is accretive. And, and we really push hard to make sure that we've covered every base on that front. And we're completely incentivized to do so, as we're the larger shareholders. There's, an there's a, a question about um, what opportunities excite us moving forward. I think launching the new brand is a, is a really big deal. I know it might not seem um, as such for sort of more financially orientated people, but this allows us to pitch for much bigger work. Um, I, I like to think at the moment that we have the capabilities to pitch for, for briefs that are sort of between 500,000 and a million pounds in value. I think with this new proposition and this, and this new route to market, we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to be able to, to, to pitch for briefs that are up to two million pounds a year in value, which is obviously very exciting. Um, it also means we can pitch to, to bigger uh, companies, companies with multiple billions of revenue is it, sort, sort of the clients that, that, we're, that we're actively targeting. So I think our, our brand is very exciting. 
Um, I think that uh, we've onboarded some fantastic new clients. We, we recently, um, some of which we've announced for, for RNS. We've launched some fantastic new shows on Snapchat, which uh, 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 have started off very, very strongly. We've also hired some great people. Um, we have two new managing directors, um, one for our commerce business um, and one for our, our social inf and influencer business. And then obviously Buster, our, our COO, joined in September uh, of last year. So we, we, we've really hired and bolstered the senior team, which will allow us to onboard new clients as well as really grow the business moving forward. Um, I think that's it in terms of, of, of questions, unless there's anything else anyone wants to submit. Absolutely, it looks like that. Uh, Ollie, Theo, Philippa, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to address all of those questions that came through from investors this morning. And of course, if there are any further questions submitted today, we will make these available immediately after the presentation has ended. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll publish all those responses where it's appropriate to do so on the InvestorMeet company platform, and we'll notify you by email when these are ready for your review. Uh, Ollie, perhaps for redirecting investors uh, to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, is it possible I could just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with? Thank you. I think thank you very much for everyone's support. Um, we've we've had a we've had a what, what, what has been a very good 2021. 2022 has started very well, and we look forward to updating people with with more progress over the coming uh, months and certainly uh, before 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 the end of the year. Thank you very much. That's great. Ollie, Theo, Philippa, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to update investors this morning. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. It's going to take a few moments to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Brave Bison Group PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good morning to you all.